Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We come to worship in Him alone. And uh, welcoming everybody that's coming in. I see Mrs. Tford was out there. I was going to say, let those link boys in. You're holding them back. I know you like talking. Oh, to the link boys. Okay. We're starting with a little lightheartedness, but uh, we are serious about our time in worship today. Uh, grab your bulletins. You know we always do announcements at this time. And so let me just highlight a few things. And really everything is what I'm going to say is involves discipleship. We do many things of fellowship and service and other opportunities of ministry, but uh, I'm really going to be touching maybe on only on discipleship now just came to my mind. I'd like to make one reference to outreach, but on the back cover of the bulletin, you find the listing of our adult Sunday school studies and electives. So again, you can find a place there, adults, in those, uh, those uh, classes. We have classes for all ages. We invite you to join us. You can join Sunday school at any time, any time of the year. Uh, Bible studies have started now. We've ended up in September, so I'll see that list of offerings there coming up. One especially is coming up October 7th. We'll be getting a new type of Bible study uh, slash course of study uh, called Living Victoriously, and uh, Lori and I will be uh, teaching that and uh, I think next week she's going to give an announcement about that, more detail of that. And we're looking really forward to that. So if you have some questions about the content, how we're going to do it, we'd love to have you join us. And that'll be on the first and third Thursdays of the month. Uh, Awana, another discipleship ministry coming up October 13th. Again, be in prayer for that. The children that you know that is in that age category, we'd love to have you welcome them and bring them to uh, Awana. Uh, if you, as the Lord's laying on your heart, children in uh, youth ministry, please see Pastor Chris. Uh, he'd love to hear from you and uh, where the Lord's directing. So again, all that's coming together. And if you, can, you have questions about Awana, see the shirks also. I said about outreach. Uh, pray and go we've been doing since uh, July uh, and uh, we've had really good times with that the weather has not always played a good part in that we've had a lot of cancellations because of weather on Wednesday nights we're going to finish out September on Wednesday night uh, but in October we're going to have one Sunday uh, with a special emphasis we'll call it pray and go Sunday We'll have our regular services in Sunday school, but at 12 noon, those that want to join us for Pray and Go, we're going to give you lunch, a very simple lunch. We'll have a short time of lunch, and then we're going to go out into the neighborhood, again, prayer, prayer walking and just hanging a door a hanger on each door that we meet. So we want to finish out the Pray and Go season with a Pray and Go Sunday. That'll be in October, most likely mid-October. Uh, more details will be there. You say, I don't know what I'm going to do. How do you do this? You'll be assigned, if you're new, uh, somebody that's already been doing it. So you don't feel alone. We don't just throw you out there. But we've been having a really good nights of uh, going out there in the community. And again, we want to make an our community aware that there's a church that's praying for them and concerned about our community. Your prayer list, of course, is filled always every week for our church and community prayer needs. Let me give you some updates. Uh, we have listed Marie Elliker at York Hospital. She's now home recovering. Don Hammer was listed at UPMC Memorial. He's home recovering. So everybody's out of the hospital. We praise the Lord for that, but continue to pray for those households. Uh, we ask you to pray for the, the Shearer family. Uh, Blaine Shearer uh, grew up here. Uh, his family uh, grew up here and um, at 54 passed away this week uh, after suffering with COVID. So remember uh, the Shearer family in your prayers. The services are on, services on Tuesday. So remember uh, Linda and their children in your prayers. 
that's all of our announcements. And now our focus is on worship, and you'll see in your order of worship in the bulletin, it says hymn favorites and offerings of praise. So after the praise team, we're going to enter into it more music and worship, but you're going to give us a, a favorite, and we're going to sing the first and last stanza of the hymn that you select for us. But we're also looking for offerings of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, a God sighting, as we call it in VBS, what you know can praise the Lord, thank the Lord for, we invite you to share during that time. So let's come now, Stan, as I've been saying, give a big smile to everybody, a wave, engage each other, and let's come before the Lord and engage him in worship today. Hello and welcome this morning. What are y'all doing way back there? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's all right. You'll just have to sing a little louder, that's all. It is our privilege to worship with you this morning and join us in song as we start out with Lord, I lift your name on high. Peter 1, 3 and 4, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Our next song is entitled Living Hope. Turn. 
the only Jesus some people will ever see. Just consider that as we finish with our final song entitled Love Through Me. church family good morning let's pray together oh lord that would be our prayer love through me and speak through me and weep through me oh lord i pray that you would use each and every one of us as your vessel as your spokesperson help us lord when we do go astray ourselves or when we mess up ourselves lord i pray that we would count on you that we would get back on the right track and we would be the ones to love through us. Thank you for loving us first, and we love you, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is our praise and song time. And so how about we start with a praise, a thanksgiving, a God sighting. Who would like to share? Pastor Chris, I know you had something go on yesterday. Okay, yeah. you get two minutes. Okay. Um, yesterday we had the
told that the orders for my medical retirement had been rescinded and that I was extended out to my full 20-year retirement, which is uh, Christmas Day of this year. So I have a great Christmas present coming up, and I'll give my 20 years, which is what I wanted when I signed up in 2001. So. Amen. The Lord gives us the desires of our heart. Amen. Thank you. How about a song? Who would like to give a song selection? We'll sing the first and last stanzas of your hymn selection. 542. When we all get to heaven, one in four. Another praise, testimony, thanksgiving. Jacob. My last two weeks have been actively chaotic. Anyone that's following my life. Uh, started on Labor Day, I crashed my car, totaled it. And uh, the Lord was working. I got my check and I got, was able to get another car quickly. Um, so that was a wonderful praise. You didn't move too far. You're still in Dover, right? Good, good, good. Thank you, Jacob. How about a song? Song selection? Josh, what's your song? 43? Okay. Great is thy faithfulness, one in three.
in any more uh, praise testimony? I know sometimes I've been known to kind of shut people down before. Yes, go ahead. Praise the Lord, our protector. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. One more song. One more song. 381. And during this song, we're going to dismiss the children of Junior Church Ministries. 381, 1 and 3. Join me in prayer, will you? Lord, we bow before you, our hearts, our minds, because you are worthy of all our praise, glory, and honor. As our creator, sustainer, savior, comforter, 
Words really cannot capture all that you are. We will attempt to do that with our testimonies, with how we live and serve. Yes, as Robin said, we may be the only way people see Jesus. And Lord, help us in our witness that we would just be able to share your truth, your grace, by sharing our story of how you transformed us. There's many things upon our hearts and minds to pray for, and we're still praying through this pandemic, Lord. We thank you for the protection that's been given, the healing that has been given to many, but our hearts are also broken for the lives lost during this pandemic. And we think of the Shearer family and their extended family. We pray for Linda and the children. They grieve a, a husband and father. We grieve a brother in Christ. Lord, comfort that family. Lead them in the path you have before them. And many others, Lord, are suffering, not just from the pandemic, but in other things in this fallen world where there is pain and suffering. But you are the victor. You give us victory in living. Doesn't mean it's always easy, but you give us strength and your grace is sufficient for all we need. We thank you for that. We come, Lord, also to the word. May the word be alive to us as your spirit leads us in hearing it, reading it, applying it. And then may we go forth and share it and live it out. And may we be found to be in your will always by obeying. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. While we're doing that and as I'm getting in place, I just want to welcome those who have been watching us online today and others on their Sundays, you've been with us. We don't forget about you, we know you're there. And again, we kind of say to you in that Facebook feed, live stream right now, if you want to say hello, you want to share a prayer request, you may do so. You want to share a praise, a thanksgiving to the Lord, you can do that too, and we'll acknowledge that. And uh, we thank you for that. So we are... Also, at our time here now for our Living by the Word, <clears throat> and uh, this is your test, and I think you can do this one pretty well, pretty well. There's only four spaces, but it's a very, again, familiar passage. Again, I hope you're, again, you're reading, studying, meditating, memorizing, praying, obeying, and sharing the Scriptures, sharing the Scriptures, living them out. So, again, as I read, you fill in the blanks. John 15, 7 and 8. If you in me and my remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my glory that you bear much, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Very well. Well, I think you're tied with 8 o'clock service and completion here. But again... Uh, let's read it together boldly, honorably, God's word, starting at John, John 15, 7 and 8. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. And again, uh, this will lead us as we, this month of looking on discipleship uh, scripture, in October we're going to begin a series simply called Disciple and looking at what did Jesus say about if you do this, you are truly my disciples. So we're going to look at that, how Jesus defines 
disciples, those that follow him. So now, uh, today, we're just kind of, we do a lot of series, but we're doing some single uh, sermons today. And, and we're in the uh, Old Testament. One of my favorite stories, and I have a lot of them, but this is one of the favorites and uh, from 2 Kings chapter 5. Anybody heard the name Naaman before? Naaman? Yes, okay. And it's a great story. It's a really great story. And yet Naaman lived thousands and thousands, uh, about, about 1,300 years maybe before Jesus. Okay, so it's an old story, okay? But it's a powerful story. And it's kind of about a story that you could, I hope, relate to. Relate to a guy, 1300 BC. I can relate to him. Solomon wrote that there's nothing new under the sun. There's a lot of just human nature uh, and just the facts of life. That life is difficult. Life is fragile. There's suffering. There's pain. There's sickness. There's healing. There's joy. The Lord gives, and we're going to see that in this story. A lot of things in the story. But I hope you find that you can relate to it. You can relate to it, okay? And we're going to wrap that up at the end about how you can relate to this. I hope you'll see. So let's start 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. So let's set the scene here, okay? Nahum, he's a commander. He's over the entire army of a country called Aram. You will not find that on a modern map, okay? But you will find a country uh, in the Middle East called Syria. You've heard of Syria, right? There's a civil war that's going on there. Sometimes the U.S. is involved in a lot of it, but a lot of times behind the scenes we are, and Russia's there. It's really a, a, you know, a bad point right now in, in the world. But uh, So this was Syria long ago, and it was called uh, Aram. Uh, the king of Aram, his name was ben the II, if you, you're in history, uh, but he's not mentioned by name here specifically in this passage. And uh, so we have a Naaman, who's really second in charge, second in command of the nation after the king, okay? So he has a very high position. He's been victorious. And it says here, even the Lord had given him a victory. God was given this uh, non-believing, Jew, non-Jew and his country blessing. Why? Because Israel, at that time, if you read Kings... Uh, the, this portion in this here, they were in apostate. They were out of faith and obedience with God. And so there was that cycle going on, and God was bringing a lot of judgment. And so there was a lot of conflict between Aram and Israel, okay? And Naaman was successful in bringing this, this kind of judgment, we could see, uh, from God to Israel. And so he, we have his uh, resume, we'd say, He's a commander, he's highly respected, but there's a note there. Did you see the note at the end of that first verse? But he had leprosy. And if you would tell your story, I would tell my story. We always kind of list what? Where our achievements and our education in a resume, maybe personal experiences, uh, skills you've learned. But if you're going to tell your story outside that resume, you might say, but I have this, or I struggle with this. Maybe you only share that with family and friends, or that maybe the closest people in your life. But it seems like we all have that ending, but Pat blank. You could fill in your, your blanks there about you, okay? So again, this is about life. This story is about life. A successful man, but he had leprosy. And you know what leprosy is? You know, we've heard it, we read about it a lot in the scriptures at times. People afflicted with le leprosy. It's a skin disease. Modern times, it's called Hansen's disease. It still exists in parts of the world, like India. And sometimes it may just be a spot, 
of a, 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 a skin infection, a wound that never heals. It could be over the whole person's body. So again, his may have been small, and then we'll, we'll get to that, why we get that idea in a moment. But in the resume of life, we all have kind of that but this, that we kind of may be embarrassed of, we struggle with, and, and, it, and, it, and enslaves us even. So let's go to verse 2. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So we have a, a, a Jewish girl, Israelite girl. She works for Naaman's wife. And she says, You know, back in Israel, in the area of Samaria, uh, there's a prophet, there's a man of God that could heal him. So what can we learn just in that one verse? We're learning a lot already in one verse. Second verse is, never underestimate the power of a simple witness. Never underestimate the power of a simple witness. A simple slave girl now speaking to a powerful household and she's just simply telling what she knows. Sometimes we, we worry about our witness. We, we, we just like, I don't know what to say. I don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. No one knows all of Scripture. But the Lord and the Holy Spirit will give you the, the answers you need for that moment. I know He does. But this little girl, she remembers there's one that does miracles and amazing things, and he's a man of God. And my master needs to go see him, a simple witness. Maybe you've just learned today that from a little slave girl that you have a witness, and your simple witness can be amazing for somebody that needs to be restored and transformed by God. Verse 4, Naaman went to his master and told him, what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. So you can see how uh, much of a reputation Naaman has and a, the, his reputation as a good man it appears to be. And uh, the king sends this letter. And interesting, I mean, kind of like they're enemies, you may think. And they are, but it's kind of like there's times there have been peacefulness. But I mean, here's a guy that led battles against Israel. And he's being sent to Israel to get healing. Isn't interesting? But so, uh, and he, he brings a lot of reward with him when he gets healed. Verse 7, as soon as the king of Israel, and his name's Joram, we, we know that in, from history, uh, Joram read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? Maybe you've never been asked to heal somebody. But you know, you may be in a place, uh, can you do this? And you're saying, why ask me? Do I have the skills? Do I have the ability? Do I have the knowledge? Why me? Am, am I God? You know, again... We're living in a, they're living in a time where the, there's not much faith in Israel. And the king, he's just focused on himself. How can I heal this guy? Yet this is the king to be of the chosen people of God. And he's just forgotten God. And he thinks, I, I have to do it. And many times we find ourselves in that place. It may be an impossible situation. And like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he says, he's trying to pick a fight with me. Interesting. Let's go on. 
many times we'll find that we're in a hopeless situation, don't we? We always focus on our insufficiency instead of focusing on the one who is totally sufficient, right? Remember that verse from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 9? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is really a, a, a principle, a truth that we'll find through this story of Naaman here. And it can be in your story also. Verse 8. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. You know, we see the pride of Naaman here, don't we? And we all struggle with pride at times. So Elijah says, send him to me, I'll heal him. He gets to Elijah's house with the crowd that is with him. And Elijah sends a messenger to him. Okay? Again, this is a guy that's been, you know, knows to give orders to people. He expects things from people. He's been honored by people. So he's very prideful. And he says, he's not even can come to the door and tell me. And, you know, he can just come and wave his hand over the spot. So we're, seeing, again, assuming that it's isolated, this leprosy. Rub his, wipe his, you know, rub his hand over the spot and make it go away. But now you tell me to go wash in the dirty Jordan River where we have better, cleaner water back home. See, Naaman thought his healing would come from the water. So it was logical that go to better water for a better healing. And sometimes don't we say that to God's plans? Can't you give me anything better? This is too simple. This is too simple. But again, it wasn't about the water, was it? It's about obedience. Obedience. Naaman's restoration will come through obedience. Your restoration, what you're dealing with, will only come through obedience. See, unbelievers have not... Naaman is an unbeliever right now. And believe, unbelievers know nothing about the things of God. They think they do, but they only complicate things that are very simple. One verse from Scripture, you may want to jot this down to look up later, but 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Paul says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Only a born-again person by the Spirit of God who faithfully accepts Jesus and His grace has the knowledge to be able to read the Word, hear from the Spirit of God, and apply it. Maybe you, before you became a Christian, you tried to read the Bible, and it was like, I just can't understand it. And, and that's the truth, because you don't have the mind of God that he gives, gives to believers, the Spirit of God to show you and convict you and lead you and renew you by the Word. And so Naaman is being told by Elijah, the prophet, go and do this. And he's just like, no, this is too, not, this does not, I don't understand this. Well, he doesn't have the faith right now. He doesn't have the faith. Verse 13, 
Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself into the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He's come to faith in the God of Israel. Okay? D.L. Modi, evangelist, preacher of long ago, decades ago, said this about Naaman's story. Naaman lost his temper, then he lost his pride, then he lost his leprosy. And that is generally the order in which proud, rebellious sinners are converted. I would say, yes, that is so true about us. A radical change maybe takes your temper away, then it takes your pride away, and all that, that you've been plagued with because of the fallenness of mankind, the sinful nature, your, your, your desires for the world, the flesh, and the devil, he takes that away and changes it. Let's go on. Then he says, please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So he says, no, I don't want anything. I mean, and that was a really nice prize, right? Gold, silver, sets of clothing. Who wouldn't want that? But what if Elijah had accepted the gift? What would he have been doing? Would it have been seen that Elijah did this miracle? That Elijah would get the praise? And God wouldn't get the glory? So Elijah knew that, no, I don't need this. Let's give it all the glory to God. Give glory to God. Verse 17. If you will not, said Naaman, please let your servant be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. What a strange request, huh? I don't think you find it anywhere else in the Bible, this kind of request. So what's going on here? Is he going home? I, my garden, I hear this Israelite soil is very fertile. I could, you know, pot some plants and make a garden with this soil. No, that's not what's going on, is it? So what's going on? Well, possibly two things. First would be, and, and then I'll... As we go in the story, I'll show you maybe the second possibility for the use of this soil. Again, he has proclaimed the God of Israel, his God, and that there's only one God, and that's God's, Israel's God, Yahweh. So perhaps he's going to take this home, and maybe in his yard he makes a tabernacle, a tent of where he's going to worship, and he's going to spread that soil out there, and he, that's going to just give him a recognition of the presence of the God of Israel. Now, God's not in that soil, of course. We know that. But it's just a symbolic representation to him that the God of Israel, he is sovereign over all. He is the only God. And that's with his place of worship. So that's one possibility. So again, let's move on. Verse 18. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elijah said. He didn't argue with him. He just said, go ahead. You want to do that? So the second possibility for that soil Perhaps Naaman gets back and nobody knows except the soil sub, maybe the people, the servants that were with him on that journey. And he goes to the temple of Rimon, who was like the chief god of Aram. And uh, 
He goes in there and he spreads the dirt on the ground there. And uh, he knows Remon's nothing, nothing. But he has a civic duty. Okay? He wasn't asking Elijah, is it okay to worship another god too? He wasn't asking that. He says, I have a civic duty that when the king goes and worships Rimon, that I, you know, maybe the king's a little bit feeble and he needs assistance. And he goes in there with him and he's holding on to the king's arm and guiding him. And he's going down to kneel and he has to go down to kneel too. He's just saying, you know, the soil that I'm kneeling on is the God of Israel's. And he's the true God. So man, maybe again, he kept his faith silent for a while. We don't know the rest of the story and what happens there. But again, we don't want to imagine too much. But again, that's a second possibility, I think, for the soil. So that kind of ends there, but it's not the end of the story. Let's move on to verse 19, the second part of it. After Naaman had traveled some distance... Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to him, My master was too easy on Naaman, the Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried from after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he asked. Just a note here. I think we see a, a change in Naaman's character. Remember, he was upset that Elijah didn't come to the door and he, a messenger was sent and he, you know, he had that pride. Here we find he's just going down the road in the chariot and another, a servant comes, but this time he gets out of the chariot. More of a humble person. Maybe just a note there to see, again, the signs of humbleness beginning in Naaman. So he said, uh, let's go on. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country and of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Lie number one. Okay. Lie number one. Verse 23. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags. With two sets of clothing, he gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. Then he went in and stood before his master, Elijah. Where have you been, Gehazi, Elijah asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere. Lie number two. You know, when you're going to lie, you got to keep, keep it going with more lies. Elijah asked, Where, your servant had, had, didn't go anywhere, Gehazi asked. But Elijah said, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or men servant or maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elijah's presence and he was leprous, as white as snow. Wow. Wow. The judgment of God. The judgment of God. Elijah said, you know, is this the time to take reward? And it's not. What can we learn here in this portion? Here? True service True service for God is motivated by love and devotion to God and seeks no personal gain. Seeks no personal gain. So when you and I serve, we shouldn't look for anything in return. 
Now, there may be times of blessing and care, but, you know, I'll pray for you if you give me $5. I hope I never hear those words from anybody. Maybe some of those televangelists, you may have that same kind of thing going on, but we won't go there. That's a sermon maybe for another time. But when you serve, do you just look to just give what God has given you of truth, time, talent, treasures, and don't look for anything in return because, in a sense, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 15. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. There's all forms of greed. And sometimes it even creeps into our service. And what is the motivation for our service? For somebody to praise you, compliment you, give you a gift in return? A humble, obedient child of God serves because that's what his Lord wants him to do. So I told you, it's an interesting story, the story of Naaman. And Naaman was restored. His body was cleansed from the leprosy. But there was a lot of other restoration, wasn't there, in his life? He went from worshiping a, a pagan god named Remon, and perhaps even other gods, and now he's solely worshiping, obeying the God of Israel, Yahweh. A spiritual transformation. And I started out this morning again, your, your life resume, your life story, and may have that, that ending of your, your, your accomplishments, your nice stories, but there's that one thing or many things about you. But Pat has a pro problem with pride. Or Lori has a problem with blank. Dan has a problem with blank. We all could put our names and blanks there. I'm not just picking on two people. I don't know exactly what's going on in their lives. But I know we all need restoration. We all need restoration. It's time for you to think, Lord, yeah, I've been trying to heal this on my own. I'm trying to be victorious this on my own. I've tried my ways and everything is exhausted and I can't do it. But your grace, your power is sufficient. Your grace and power is sufficient. Will you humble yourself, confess what you need, ask for that restoration and healing? And friends, it starts with faith and obedience. Faith only in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. They who died for your sins, who rose again from the dead, the power that raised Jesus from the dead gives you a new life as you accept God's grace by faith. And he can transform and restore you. Will you trust him for the restoration? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the story of Naaman. That's been preserved for us through the centuries to this moment that we would hear it. All of us has that part of our story, Lord, that there's that thing that's incomplete, that has caused us pain. It, it, it causes us confusion and frustration and anxiety and so much heartache. But you're the one that's the healer. Your grace and power is sufficient. And in and, and, and our weakness, your power is perfect. Help us to grow in faith in that. Help us to trust each one here, Lord, as we give 
over what we're struggling with. May you restore us and heal us, empower us. And we know it starts with faith and obedience. May we be humbled. We get rid of our pride, confess our sin, confess our problems, confess our need, and seek your will and your will alone. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to God's word in worship and song. Three forty nine, trust and obey. Three forty nine, trust and obey. We're going to just sing the first, third, and I believe fifth. Yes, first, third, and fifth verses of this song. Three forty nine, trust and obey. <coughs> I'm going to stay up front here after the service. Uh, I hope you'll welcome each other and greet one another with the joy of the Lord and the love of the Lord. But I'm going to remain here. And if you need to talk about a restoration of your life that you want to give over to the Lord, what your struggles are, what your sin is, I'd like to pray with you, bring the word to you at this time, okay? And uh, Pastor Chris, why don't you be out there and just greet them as they go, okay? And uh, let's receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you with His all-sufficient grace and power. May you hear His truth and have faith and obey. Amen.